Well, good morning. If you are a guest, I am Pastor Kirby. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great uh, that the pseudo so-called storm held off and uh, we can make it together. I do have to say second service is a little fuller than first, so the roads must be getting a little better. That's good. Um, if you're a guest, this next thing might not apply, but it's the easiest way to help uh, for me to get an information out uh, to you. So some of you have been praying for my dad, and my dad was hospitalized on Thursday, uh, pneumonia, both lungs, the flu, and uh, he had no immune system from cancer treatments and all this stuff. He's still in ICU. He's still uh, heavily sedated uh, and still going, but some of the numbers are looking pretty good. Uh, so we're hoping it gets through this weekend, essentially. So that's our goal. Baby steps, day at a time. So inform you uh, more personally if you want to know more, but that's that. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing that. But we're in the middle of our series. That we're actually extending this series uh, called The Color Value of Relationships. It was this, this snow and everything else and schedules have kind of uh, made us audible a little bit. And so that's what we're doing. We're extending this series um, called the color value of relationships. And, and we've been in a place, we've talked about the, the differences, the personality types. And uh, Pastor Sheila gave a, gave a great class and teaching on understanding the value of that and identifying uh, the color of your personality. We talked about uh, understanding how to give grace in relationships. We, we started the series talking about uh, divorce, and, uh, and that's kind of a touchy subject. Uh, uh, but then we're today, uh, oh, then last week we talked about how to have relationships within a church and other churches. Today we're going to talk about the relationship kind of with ourselves. What, what is that like? What is it like to have uh, a relationship with yourself? Because if you're kind of anything like me, it's like I don't, I don't know how anybody would want a relationship with me kind of because, you know, I, I know who I am and you struggle. And, that, and that'll lead to a bigger uh, thing we're going to talk about today. Um, so... We're going to look at a psalm. We're going to look at Psalm 143. Um, I'm going to read from the message version today. So if you have a Bible app, that's going to be the easiest. But if you've never read the message, following into different translations is going to be incredibly difficult. Okay, so you can pull it up in your Bible app. It'll also be on the screen if you wish to follow along. Um, but in the military, there's, there's often there's certain commands. There's six levels of, uh, of commands to bring people together, to get... Uh, people's um, awareness, their focus, their body. There's six of them. And the highest level, the highest one of these commands is, is brought everybody's attention. Everybody. So you bring your eyes, you bring your heart, you bring your body, you bring your focus. Everybody, everywhere in that room comes to the same point of focus. Now, there are times where I'm watching a movie or listening to uh, well-meaning people, and, and maybe this movie is a military focused, and they'll, they'll be saying things, and they'll say this phrase, Ten Hut. Anybody ever heard that? See, now, military people are a unique bunch. We're, we're a little finicky, and, and so we hear these phrases, and it makes our skin crawl. See, the reality is the command is not Ten Hut. The command is attention. It's an actual word. Attention. And when somebody says attention, the room focuses in. Their body, their eyes, their ears all go to who's ever needing the point of attention. So, yeah, we get a little uh, high strung and, and, and focused in when somebody says 10 hut. So please don't use that word, okay? Just humor me. All right, don't use that word. It, it's, it's attention. Now, all of that serves a purpose about what we're going to talk about today in terms of attention and getting our attention. So we're going to read now. We're going to read in Psalms 143. And again, I'm reading it in the message version this morning. Let's look at this together. <laughs> Listen to this prayer of mine, God. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Answer me. You're famous for your answers. Do what's right for me, but don't. Please don't haul me into court. Not a person alive would be acquitted there. The enemy hunted me down, kicked me and stomped me within an inch of my life. He put me in a black hole, buried me like a corpse in that dungeon. I sat there in despair, my spirit draining away, my heart heavy like lead. I remembered the old days, went over all you've done, pondered the ways you've worked, stretched out my hands to you as thirsty for you as a desert thirsty for rain. Hurry with your answer, God. I'm nearly at the end of my rope. Don't turn away. Don't ignore me. That would be certain death. 
If you wake me each morning with the sound of your loving voice, I'll go to sleep each night trusting you. Point out the road I must travel. All, I'm all ears, all eyes before you. Save me from my enemies, God. You're my only hope. Teach me how to live to please you because you're my God. Lead me by your blessed spirit into cleared and level pasture land. Keep up your reputation, God. Give me life. In your justice, get me out of trouble. In your great love, vanquish my enemies. Make a clean sweep of those who harass me. And why? Because I'm your servant. Psalm 143 is one of these psalms written by David where he's writ, he wrote this when he was in a valley of trouble. He was in a low spot and, and, and maybe in like a world like ours. And we can understand and sympathize with the sentiments that, that David expressed of this, this fear and concern. See, from the day we're born, we are all seeking attention. Every one of us, we're seeking for attention from the day we're born. Psychology professor Rudolf Dreikers once said this, children need attention like a plant needs sun and water. I don't know about you, but I can barely keep a plant alive. But that might be why some of us struggle with the kids a little bit. They need attention like a plant needs sun and water. A lot of it. They need it all the time. So what does a baby do? A baby cries for attention. A toddler will destroy things. A teenager will change their appearance, change their verbiage, change things they do to get attention. A, a young adult is going to get a degree. They're going to they're pursue a relationship to get attention. An adult maybe will pursue uh, a promotion. Maybe they'll pursue that relationship. Maybe they'll pursue ways of saying things to other people for attention. But when you get to those golden years, it's not until you reach that point that your voice starts to get a little softer and the cry for attention isn't as loud. Here's the difficulty, though. When usually when you reach that point, that's when you need the attention the most. Because oftentimes there's a feeling of being forgotten, being ignored, but your voice isn't as loud anymore. We're always crying and starving for attention, every single one of us in a different way. I remember growing up, my, my grandfather was put in a nursing home uh, when I was in about fifth grade, and, and, and that's what I remember a lot of. And he, he lived there until his passing as well. But I remember going and, and visiting him, and a lot of times the nurses or technicians would, would say, it's so great to see you come and visit your grandfather. I'm like, why would we not visit my grandpa? It doesn't make any sense. Well, what they would explain to us is that many times the, the residents there are dropped off. And their own family doesn't come to visit them. Their own children don't come to visit them. They say a lot of times the residents here become depressed and it becomes hard and sad. And it, it didn't make a lot of sense for us, but for them, it was a very big deal. See, our longing for people's attention is a driving force in our lives. And no matter what age we're at, no matter what we're doing, it looks different for each of us. For each one of us, the driving attention we need is different, but it's there. Author and retired pastor Jim Reepsom shared a story. He, they did a study about teenage prostitutes in San Francisco. And in this study, they asked this question. Is there anything you needed most and couldn't get? And their response invariably, after the sadness and tears, was almost unanimous. They said, what I needed the most was someone to listen to me, someone who cared enough to listen to me. We all long and cry and desperately need someone to listen, to pay attention to us, someone to simply notice we exist. We often have that feeling with God. God, are you there? Kind of, do you recognize what's going on here? Hello? Are you paying attention? Give me some attention here. You know, we want God to come in and remove everything from our lives because, well, God is God, right? And God can do that kind of stuff, and who wouldn't want it? And so we cry out for God's attention. And we've been told that since we're in diapers, that that's all we have to do. Just talk to God, pray to God, and God will give you the utmost attention. So we have that in our heads. Other times, it's the other way around. 
We're, we're in our thing and, 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 and we're saying, yeah, God, I've got my things, but you know what? That, that, look at the world around us. I mean, look what's going on in this country, in this town, in this family, all of these things. Look at, just go focus on them. Don't worry about me. I'll be just fine. And we don't give God any attention. David was in a situation in this psalm where he was constantly being pursued. He was being tracked. He, wanted, he was being hunted to be killed. And he was being hunted and pursued by none other than his own son. Can you picture that? His own son was hunting him and wanting him eliminated. Can you imagine the deep fear and depression that he was in? I mean, it was like he was completely forgotten. He was a king. He was a warrior. He was, the Bible says he was uh, handsome. And now he's just forgotten like he never existed. And he's on the run. And he's in constant pursuit and constantly running. And I can imagine his physical and emotional exhaustion that he had from the constant running. And once again, we see him in this psalm seeking God's attention, saying, God, answer me. David was all of these amazing things, but he's still seeking God. Look what it says in verse 1. Listen to this prayer of mine, God. Pay attention to what I'm asking. Answer me. You're famous for your answers. In the midst of this adversity, there's a point where David, I imagine, to the point of depression that he's facing. David needed attention. There was one day that a, that a preacher who had just lost his family in a tragic fire, he'd fallen into this deep and dark depression. And he goes for a walk and he's out walking and he sees this other church being constructed and built and he thought he'd stop and just watch the crew work for a while. And as he's doing it, he sees a stonemason, a stone worker out cutting a, a, a stone. And so he goes up to the, the worker and he asks what he's doing and he says, well, you see uh, that steeple up there um, and that little hole in that little space. I am cutting this stone down here so I can fit it in up there. To which... The, the pastor was reminded in a new way of the faithfulness of God. He was reminded that God is carving him, shaping him, and using him, and using the tools in this world for a purpose greater than himself. Shaping him down here so he would fit up there. We live in a world that's filled with people like this man and like David, and our lives are filled with depression. It's filled with despair. It's de- filled with defeat. And, and, and we're many, many people over the years have been plagued by this. Great preachers, hymn writers, poets, artists, people have been plagued with very strong bouts of depression. 18th century preacher Charles Spurgeon was filled with depression. Even David, a man after God's own heart, was filled with depression. So that depression that he was in this valley, we'll call it a valley, He was in this valley of defeat. He's running from his son. He's wondering why nobody even is acknowledging who he is anymore. Everything was forgotten. He feels like God is somewhere out there, but he doesn't know. And so the pain showed himself. There's pain in that valley, and that pain in that valley shows itself in a few ways. The first pain in the valley is the pain of no help. Verse 3 says, The enemy hunted me down. He kicked me and he stomped me within an inch of my life. He put me in a black hole, buried me like a corpse in that dungeon. The enemy at the time is his son. His own son, Absalom, is pursuing him, ready to get rid of him. It's like David's already dead. It's it's just completely forgotten. Many people are in in that dark valley of depression and feel that there's no way out. They feel like everybody, everything around them is, is surrounding them and they can't get out of the valley. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. In fact, it's just completely blocked. There's, there's no end period. It just stops. The next pain in the valley is the pain of no heart. Verse 4 says this, I sat there in despair, my spirit draining away, my heart heavy like lead. Man, what an awful experience. To be pursued and chased and hated by your own son, much less your entire nation or people that you were leading. Even in Psalm 41 verse 9, we see how terrible it was. David had, had a good friend and his own friends turned their backs on him. It says, it, it, ah, 
It says, even my best friend, the one I always told everything, he ate meals in my house all the time. He has bitten my hand. See, those who had served David faithfully turned their backs on him. They treated him with indifference and they rejected him. I mean, I can imagine that's just completely overwhelming. And, and, and it, it's as if David, his heart can't go on. He can't believe what's going on. And many of us are in that place of, of trying to figure this out where we feel like the world's against us, our friends have turned on us, our families have disowned us, our jobs are bad, the city's bad, and, and we don't know how we're going to get through the valley. Now, nobody's around that can be seen. David fought another pain in the valley. It was the pain of no hope. Verse 7, hurry with your answer, God. I'm nearly at the end of my rope. Don't turn away. Don't ignore me. That would be certain death. David tells God how depressed he is. Because the truth was in that moment of life, he asked God not to turn his face from him. Don't, don't, don't turn away, God. Don't. See, that would be the worst thing possible. I know everybody else is right now. Please don't you do it as well. He reached the end of his rope. He reached the end of it. And, and he just couldn't lift that veil of darkness in his life. He was at the end. He's no better off than being dead. So he thought. David could think of no worse than God ignoring him. So he asks, God, keep an eye on me. Don't ignore me. Don't turn your face away from me. Please keep looking at me. Give me attention. Many of us are in this valley and many of us have that feeling. Things would just be better if I were dead instead of suffering through all of this. Things would just be better off if, if I didn't have to deal with that. But I want to encourage you this morning with all the, the despair, the, the pain, the, the loneliness, the hurt. There's pain. But there's also a reason to hope, and it's in this psalm. Because we're going to see that there's a, there's, there's a prize in the valley that we're in. The first prize is the prize of repentance. Verse 2, but don't. Please don't haul me into court. Not a person alive would be acquitted there. We, we often praise David, but David failed miserably. Over and over, David screwed up. He was not a perfect man. But, and he recognized that, look, if I stand before God on my own merits, on everything that I did, I can't hold up. Nothing I can do is going to be good enough in the sight of God. Instead, David acknowledges his guilt. He acknowledges that he messed up. And he asks God not to hold on to his sin. Psalm 32, David says, Count yourself lucky. How happy you must be. You get a fresh start. Your slate's wiped clean. Count yourself lucky. God's holding nothing against you, and you're holding nothing back from him. All right, hear me on this. The dark valley that you're in or you've been in is not necessarily a result of sin. Okay? I am not telling you that something you have sinned has caused you to get this place. It might have, but I'm not saying it necessarily is. But the reality is, when we begin to seek God, the sin, the things in our lives will need to be dealt with. And that is our hope, is that we're going to seek God. 1 John 1 says this, If we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, make a clean breast of them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. If we claim that we've never sinned, we walk, we out and out contradict God, make a liar out of him. A claim like that show, only shows off our ignorance of God. See, whether or not sin is, is the reason or the cause of your valley, we're still sinners. We're still in need of repentance. And anything that brings us closer to a relationship with God is a big prize. Psalm 66, verses 18 and 20. All believers, come here and listen. Let me tell you what my God did for me. I called out to him with my mouth. My tongue shaped the sound of music. If I had been cozy with evil, the Lord would never have listened. But he most surely did listen. He came on the double when he heard my prayer. Blessed be God. He didn't turn a deaf ear. He stayed with me, loyal in his love. 
God is paying attention to you. Regardless, he has not left you and he won't leave you. He is with you in the valley. The next prize we get is the prize of remembrance. Prize of remembrance. Verse 5, I remember the old days when over all you've done, ponder the ways you've worked. David had a lot to remember. So instead of dwelling on, on the place that he's in, instead of dwelling on the valley, and he could have easily dwelled on his son attacking him, of all the people doing that, instead of doing that, he looked at the past, at what he has done and the, the, the experience he had with God and the way God showed up time and time again. Maybe he went back to the, as a boy where he, he conquered a lion and a bear and maybe he went back to being conquering Goliath or maybe when he was leading a nation. Goes back to those times where God was faithful. See, when walking through a dark valley, what we need to do is remember what God has done. We remember the past. We review our life. We read his word and we start to refresh our hearts. William Cowper I hope I said that name right. He was a poet and a hymn writer in the 1700s. He, he struggled with deep bouts of, of very dark depression. And, and one of these nights where he was really struggling with it and, and trying to figure it out, he said, all right, enough. I'm going to go to the London Bridge and I'm going to jump off. And I'm going I'm to take my life. He hails the, the cabbie, the, the carriage, whatever it is, and he gets in. Now, the, the day, the story goes that the day was in London was filled with just incredibly dense fog, and you couldn't see anything in front of you. And so he's in this carriage, and, and they're driving around, and they're trying to figure out where to go, and they couldn't do it. And finally, William's so frustrated, just stop, stop, I'll get out here. And he gets out, and he takes one step forward, and he recognizes he was dropped off right at the doorstep of his house. And it's at that moment when he entered his home, it became apparent that the Lord still had a use for his life. And as we, out of this space, out of this emotion and this experience, he wrote uh, the beautiful words to the poem, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And it says this, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break. In blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and will make it plain. There's another prize that comes in the valley, and it's a prize of reliance. We have a prize of reliance in the valley. Verse 6, I stretched out my hands to you as thirsty for you, as a desert thirsty for rain. David reached out to God. I, I love it when, it doesn't happen anymore, but when my kids were little, they would, they would see me, and they'd run, and they'd do this. What are that? What's that universal language? Pick me up, Daddy. Pick me up. Pick me up. Now it's like, oh, Father. And it, it's not as, not as exciting. But they would do this, and, and, and the natural response is, what, come in, sweep them, pick them up, and hold them. And, uh, because there's, there's trust. There's love. There's, there's strength. There's an encouragement. It's that, that, that gesture that they're reaching out. It's that same gesture I can imagine David did with God, just, God, here I am. Pick me up, hold me, embrace me. I trust you. You are strong and I can rely on you because you're a really big God. And they didn't choose the alternative in his depression. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. As terrible as the dark valleys are, they're also valuable. Because in those valleys, we're going to learn a new understanding and a depth to our faith that we never would have experienced before. There's a lot of pain in the valley. There's the prizes in the valley, but there's also a path out. 
we all want to get out of the valley. And God has encouraged us and reminded us there's a path out of the valley. The first path that helps us is the path of prayer. Several times through this psalm, David prayed. Now I can imagine, I, I, have, I, I don't think I, I'm out of line in saying this, that there were times where David really didn't want to pray probably. He didn't have anything to say. He was probably so tired and so worn out, it says he's at the end of his rope, that the, the desire and the interest in praying was not there. Maybe he did stop. But according to this, in this time he did not. Romans 12, 11 to 13 says this. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive with hospitality. God is paying attention to you. He is absolutely paying attention to you. He never promised to give us everything we want, but he is paying attention to you. And he will answer his prayer according to his will. Jeremiah 33, verse 1 to 3. This is God's message. The God who made the earth made it livable and lasting, known everywhere as God. Call to me and I will answer you. I'll tell you marvelous and wonderful things that you could never figure out on your own. So we pray when God says yes. We pray when God says no. We pray when God is silent. See, prayer is not just this religious activity. Prayer is not just done by the professional Christian at the church. That'd be me. Prayer is something we do. Prayer, it, 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 it's silence. It's a conversation. There's sometimes a lot of comfort in reciting those prayers we learned as a child. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest and may these guests be. There's comfort there. There, there's not one cookie cutter method to prayer because God is paying attention to you. God is in that dark valley. You don't need to make sure your life is in order. You don't need to make sure you're out of the valley before you come to God. The second path out is the path of praise. Path of praise. Verse 10. Teach me how to live to please you because you're my God. Lead me by your blessed spirit into cleared and level pasture land. In the midst of this sad, scary, downtrodden psalm, David issues a small word of praise. It's not this big, glorious thing. It's a small word. He, remind, he reminds us that God is good. See, when we walk in this valley, when we walk in this, this state of, of depression, downwardness, whatever it is for you, one of the last things we want to do oftentimes is think anything positive. We have, it's one of the hardest things to do is give praise to God. But it's oftentimes the most gratifying thing we can do. And I'm not talking it needs to be singing and dancing and shouting and watching some of you dance is scary, but it's not necessarily this big glorious thing. Sometimes it's only a word of thank you. You are still God. Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 22. Job got to his feet, ripped his robe, shaved his head, then fell to the ground and worshiped. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'll return to the womb of the earth. God gives, God takes. God's name be ever blessed. Not once through all this did Job sin. Not once did he blame God. The story of Job is incredible. The state of his life and the valley he was in who's still able to give praise. Luther Bridges was a preacher from North Carolina in the early 1900s. And, and they would be called a, a, a circuit rider, where you'd go from all these different places and preach in different spots. And so his, his requirement was to travel a whole lot and preach in different areas. And one of these times, his wife and three boys went to stay with her mother. Late one night, he got word that there was a fire at his mother's house, and um, the, the, the house was gone. His mom and dad made it out, but his wife and three boys all died in the fire. And he's out on the road. And it sends him into this deep state of depression. This, this question, and, and maybe you've had this, is, God, how is this even possible when I am doing your will? 
How is it even possible when I am telling people about you, when, when I'm following your call, how is it even possible that you would do this to me? Anybody ever asked that question? After some time, he took that question of why, and he sought God's attention through this. And he took his doubt, he took his frustration, and he doubted towards faith. He doubted towards Jesus, and he started reading, and he, saw, and he read Psalm 91. And in verse 1 and 2, it had grabbed him. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He is my, alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Luther thought to himself, that secret place, the, the shadow, the shelter, and the presence, he could trust God. He could trust him that the God of, of all the earth would not fail him, it would not ignore him, that it's still paying atten- God is still paying attention to him. Then, and it was following that tragedy, he wrote a, a song. Some of you are going to recognize this song. It's keeping in context with what just happened. And if you know the song, the song is kind of an upbeat, perky little song. And it doesn't jive with his experience. But when he read 91, Psalm 91, and he understood God is with him, this is what came out. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with you. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. He lost his wife and three boys, and he says Jesus is with him through the ebbs and flows? That's Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me as I go. There are days where we can bring to God just the joyous laughter. We're going to celebrate baby dedications next week. That's a celebration. And we're going to celebrate. We're going we're to sing. It's going to be great. There are other times where all we have is frustration, anger, hurt, and bitterness. And we don't have a lot to offer God. But we can be confident that God will accept whatever it is if we truly have the purpose to lift him to understand him and pursue him. God is there and he's going to make it serve his purpose. Another path out is the path of practice. Path of practice. Verse 10 says, teach me how to live to please you because you're my God. Other translations read, teach me to do your will. David's desire was to do the will of God. That was his heartfelt desire is to do the will of God. He relied on God to lead him through this valley, through everything he has, and he would follow God's leading. He knew that God was able to get him out because he believed what God said in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, it says, Be strong, take courage. Don't be intimidated. Don't give them a second thought because God, your God, is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you and he won't let you down. He won't leave you. So our prayer then is, teach me to do your will. Not only show me what your will is, but teach me to do it. Because that's what my heart is. Teach me to do it because you are my God. So in sincerity, we take God for our God. We can depend on him to show up and teach us to do his will. I hope you understand this at at this point. Uh, I want to be open with you and honest with you. And so along those lines, I want you to understand something, that there are times in my life that, that I honestly feel that there is, a, there is a darkness that comes over me. I can't explain it. My wife says maybe it's a seasonal depression. I don't know. I've never been clinically diagnosed, but there are times where something happens, and I hate every second of it. I've learned to recognize it. I've learned to understand the season I'm in, whatever that looks like. But something comes over me and it is hard to get through. It affects my family. It affects my work. It affects the people around me. And there is a lot to it. It, What I'm going through may not be anything near what you're going through, but my struggles are my struggles and yours are yours. And it's not a comparison factor. See, we all long for God's attention. And we all have valleys but God still cares. And maybe I tell you something, maybe I need to remind you something. God loves you. Maybe you haven't heard that before, maybe you haven't heard in a long time, or maybe you just don't believe it anymore. God loves you. I love you. 
God hasn't left you. God will not leave you. God is there in giving you attention. See, God has given us abilities to understand and learn. We, 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 we are understanding more of God's creation every day through science and through knowledge and everything. And it's a beautiful journey that we have. And it's amazing to see how God's creation is unpacked more and more by really amazingly smart people. And, and it's our, our hope at, at Living Hope Church that we would be a place that lives out its namesake. That, that we would live out the name of living hope. So next week, and this is what I'm really excited about. Next week, we're going to introduce you to, to uh, a lady, uh, two ladies and, and an organization that we're partnering with that is going to come and they're going to provide uh, uh, groups that we can provide support for codependency and, and alcohol and divorce care. Two are happening here and one's happening in the Methodist Church. We're going to partner with this organization because we truly believe that through this partnership, we can provide that hope and healing and people can find that in Jesus Christ. And I'm really excited for that. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say and and, and for you to come and and meet her and and, and understand a little bit about how our our brains and our bodies and our, our hearts work together. Because I truly believe that God is using all of these things, all of the tools that we have at our disposal to get us up out of the valley. We talked earlier about the military scene, and over the last, I think it was 13 years, on average per year, 6,000 veterans have committed suicide per year. That's near and dear to my heart. Suicide is in general. I've had friends. I've had a high school friend. I've had several other people along my life that have said, there is no hope. I can't get out of this valley. And they looked at my life. Everybody's life around me would be better if I wasn't around. Understand that there is another option. Please don't go down that road. Understand that you can overcome this. It does not control you. It do not let this beat you. Do not let it beat you. There are people, you look at around in this room that would love you and support you and encourage you. Oftentimes we say, nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody understands the pain I've been. I gotta tell you, it's not true. It's a hard thing to see past. I understand that. And it takes a lot of vulnerability. It takes a lot of courage to step out and ask for help. Don't let this beat you. God is in the valley with you and God will see you through the valley. Please understand that there are different options. So join us next week. Please join us. I'm so excited for you to meet uh, these people and understand the groups and, and they do individual counseling if you need it. But look, I see somebody on a regular basis. I, I talk to somebody on a regular basis. It's vital for us to walk through life not alone. Come back next week. I'm really excited about it. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, I don't understand always what goes on um, in many ways. I don't understand this world. I don't understand why decisions people make. I don't understand why I make certain decisions. But I know that this world is fallen. There is evil in this world and has broken this whole creation that you made so perfectly, but now it is broken and distorted because we have chosen other things over you and the presence of evil in our world. Father, I pray for those, maybe there's there's a man or woman in this room, no matter what age, that is in this valley, and they think, my life, the life of the people around me, this is the only way to go. Father, flood them right now with your peace. Remind them that you are there. You are paying attention to them. Give them the courage, give them the strength to step out and say, I need some help. Jesus, I am so thankful for the the doctors, the the people involved that that have taken the time to understand your creation a little bit and understand how how our minds work, how our hearts and our bodies work. And and your, your creation is so complex. We understand that it's fractured because we we've we fractured it, but it's still a beautifully complex thing. And I pray that they would have the courage to do that. 
And maybe today nobody's taking that opportunity to, to step out and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Be the Lord of my life. Help me take this time through praise, through prayer, and, 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 and all of the things taken. I can get a path out of my valley. Understand all you have to say, Jesus, I give you my life. Be my God. I can't do it anymore. I am at the end of my rope. Even if I'm not at the end of my rope, I understand that I can't do it alone. I want to follow you. Be my God. Jesus, I thank you that you have taken our place for, Jesus, for God. And you are standing between us and God. And you are standing there and you are praying for us and you are encouraging uh, us and you are speaking on our behalf. So God, we just give you this week we give you uh, this valley that we're in or the mountaintop we're in, no matter where we're at, if we're celebrating or we're concerned. Thank you, Jesus, for being present and, and coming, and, and you have our attention, and we have yours. It's in your name.